think about how difficult it is to give when we don't gather, like when, when we have snowfall. <clears throat> of course, we can save up and give later, but I wanted to mention to you that for the first time, there is a way uh, on our website if you want to give online that's, that's posted there now, so that you can always make use of that. Well, we've been studying the Lord's Prayer. It's been a very rich time for us. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, I think, is so much uh, more than many of us appreciate. Jesus meant it to be a very powerful tool to build our faith, giving us a template for prayer. And I, and I hope that's going to become even clearer today. We're down to verse 13. <clears throat> Let me just start at the beginning. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, no matter how often we recite this prayer, verse 13 just sounds awkward. It's not the way we say anything else. This lead us not into business. Now, it accurately translates, I believe, every word from uh, Greek into English, and I assume that uh, it was translated accurately from the original Aramaic into Greek. But the whole phrase sounds strange in English because it seems to be asking God not to tempt us. When the Bible tells us very, very clearly that uh, God will not tempt anyone at any time, uh, that by definition he's incapable of it. So why include in so short a prayer something God would never do anyway? Well, the answer lies in a, a common translation challenge. Every language has figures of speech. We call them idiomatic expressions, phrases that anybody who speaks the language understands perfectly well, but which don't communicate what the individual words literally mean. So, for example, if I said that something was, uh, you know, man, that's really cool, you would understand that I'm talking about something being fashionably acceptable. But you translate that into Chinese, and it could sound like, man, it's cold, okay? Because the word cool is supposed to mean something about temperature. But American English speakers all understand that the phrase, that's cool, isn't talking about temperature. Every language has such expressions, including the Aramaic that Jesus spoke. Lead us not into was one of those expressions. Now, a daily Jewish prayer of the same time period indicates what this phrase actually means. Bring me not into the power of sin, or into the power of guilt, or into the power of temptation, or into the power of anything shameful. So this line in the Lord's Prayer is not asking God to refrain from tempting us, but rather it is asking him to deliver us from being overpowered by Satan's temptations the evil one being a reference to the devil. Deliver us from being overpowered by Satan's temptations. That's what this means. Now, I don't have time to share with you everything that the Bible has to say about Satan. Suffice to say that he was the greatest angel, greatest therefore creature uh, ever created. Appointed as the guardian angel of earth, when the Lord surprisingly assigned dominion of this planet to human creatures made of dust. The way I think of it is that Satan freaked. I mean, he expected the position for himself. He became our enemy. He became our adversary. He became determined to prove we were unworthy, to discredit humanity so that the Lord himself would abandon us, leaving him to rule. Now, his, his attempts to discredit God's people were neutralized by Jesus who turned it all upside down on the cross. But until final judgment, Satan is still operative and he is amazingly formidable. Paul, in fact, says that he is capable of masquerading as an angel of light and getting away with it. He remains opposed to everything God loves, especially everything and everyone associated with Jesus Christ. He is determined to tempt us into sin and turn the image of God, supposedly us, into something corrupt. Now, what does it mean that he tempts us? A temptation is a suggestion, it's an inducement to think or feel or do something wrong, something contrary to God's revealed will, something contrary to his design. 
in a text like this, no temptation has seized you, but that's what's common to man. This is the same word highlighted here that's used in the Lord's Prayer, temptation. But now look at this text. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac. Tested here is the same word we just saw translated as tempt, and it's the same word as in the Lord's Prayer. God tested Abraham. God tested Israel. God tests us in order to assess and build our faith. Not Satan, but God. Same word. Same word describes what Satan does and what God does. And how you understand it depends on who's doing it. Because when God does it, he's trying to build up. He's trying to build godliness. When Satan does it, he's trying to discourage us. He's trying to tear us down, tear down godliness. If you want to use that same word in a more neutral fashion, you would use a third English word to translate it. It's the word trial. We have to suffer grief in various trials, and they've come so that our faith might be proved genuine. Now, this word trial is the same word that's translated tempt and translated test. You use the word trial when the context is kind of neutral. In every trial, God works to prove your faith genuine. He uses it like a test to prove that our faith is real. In every test, or excuse me, in every trial, Satan works to prove our faith false and to tempt us to demonstrate that fact. A trial is something God uses to build us up, and at the same time, Satan uses to tear us down. Let's say you have a flat tire coming home from work. Wow, what a pain, what a trial. Satan's goal is to turn that trial into a temptation that tears you down, wrecks your day, wrecks your attitude, damage relationships during the rest of the day, compromise anything good you were going to do. The Holy Spirit takes the same trial and tries to use that as a, as a test that will build you up, give you an opportunity to praise God uh, that you're alive, that he's looking out for you, uh, and that will set you up for victory the rest of the day. Trials come in all shapes, all sizes. They arise from your enemies. They arise from your friends. They arise from strangers. They arise from forces of nature. Some come once in a lifetime, like dealing with the death of your parents. Some come at you again and again and again, like managing your sexual urges. Trials are an inevitable part of life in a fallen world. Satan or God really don't have to design trials. I mean, they may, but they don't really have to. There's plenty of them to go around. And from a spiritual perspective, in terms of godliness, each one of them either builds us up or tears us down. Rarely are they just remain neutral. In every trial, God is always there for his children. The Lord watches over us. He warns us ahead of time. He helps us during, lifts us up if necessary afterwards, heals. But Satan is always there too. Now, I've got to explain that because Satan is not God. He's not the equal of God. He's a creature. He can't be everywhere at once. Now, he does have a large number of fallen angels who assist him. But the important thing to remember about Satan is he has a strategy as you look at what he does in the Scripture. He tends to spend most of his own personal time where his temptations do the most damage, with leaders, with leaders in government with leaders in education, with leaders in sports, with leaders in entertainment, with leaders in the church. Because when leaders choose to sin, when they are tried, then Satan's temptations get baked in to a culture. They get baked into a society or a community. Bake injustice into courts bake pornography into the internet and Satan doesn't have to be there personally for his temptations to reach you all the time. The point is this, that both your Lord and the evil one are working at the same place in your life at the same time. Your spiritual battle is taking place right now and always at the place where you are being tried, where you are being stressed, where things are difficult and when you are forced to respond, either with faith or not. It's in this context of repeated trials and spiritual warfare 
that we're taught to pray. Don't lead us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one, which means deliver us from being overpowered by Satan's temptations. This is the prayer to use in spiritual warfare. It is not a passive prayer to ask to avoid temptation. That's not going to happen. And it's not a prayer to avoid testing, because that's going to happen. This is a request to receive at a specific point in my life divine power that overcomes the mightiest angel God ever made as he attacks me. What do you think of when you think of the Holy Spirit's power? What do you think of? What is it? What's it for? What does it do? Power to do what exactly? Is it power to just kind of let your hair down and have a good time in worship? Is it, is it power to accomplish your dreams, be a success in this world? Is it power to replicate the day of Pentecost, complete with rushing winds and flaming tongues of fire? I mean, really, what is it? What is it? Maybe it would help if we were to see how Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. The Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Being in the wilderness for 40 days was a trial on many levels. Long time of fasting. It's just a barren, horrible place. Jesus is divine. But to represent us and to become our Savior, he had to learn how to exercise faith as a human being. And who did God choose to be his trainer? Wise old rabbi, John the Baptist? He chose the evil one. God tested and trained his son by allowing Satan to tempt him. He did it on purpose. In fact, we're told in Hebrews that we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are. Every way. Now, Satan had no desire to train Jesus or build him up. His only thought was to destroy him. But God intentionally used Satan's personal temptations to teach Jesus' humanity how to exercise faith as a human being and, in fact, how to exercise power. And look at the result. He returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. First time that's said about him. Jesus emerged from overcoming the personal temptations of Satan. He, re he came out of that in the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit came from overcoming the temptations of Satan. The reason Jesus came was to destroy what Satan had done to us. That's why he came. In his humanity, he, he, he required the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And he had it. When Peter described Christ, he said that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. That's what he did. The power of the Holy Spirit is not about signs and wonders or anything that God may use to highlight its appearance. The power of the Holy Spirit is the power to overcome the work of the devil. Jesus came out of the wilderness with that power after he learned to use it against Satan's temptations against him. And the implications of that are huge because Jesus is kind of leading us through the same path. We're asking God to give us personal victory over the evil one. Personal victory is the key to combating Satan in this world, to do good, to bring healing, and to reverse his work in the lives of others. This part of the Lord's Prayer is about victory in spiritual warfare. If we can defeat Satan, 
in the temptations he throws against us in the midst of our trials, because that's where they come, is in trials. If we, can, if, we can, if we can find power to defeat Satan when he comes at us in our trials with temptations, we can defeat him anywhere. And if we find no victory over Satan when he comes at us in our trials with temptations, we're not going to find victory anywhere else. You know, the Lord's Prayer would be amazingly powerful if we just used it. I don't think most Christians used it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think most Christians use it. I think we, we recite it. I don't think we use it as a template for prayer. Reciting the Lord's Prayer, in my, in my mind, I, I mean, unless you're doing it as part of a celebration or something, I mean, reciting the Lord's Prayer is like sending your 1040 back to the IRS blank with a, a, a post-it note attached, I read through the whole thing. You're not supposed to just read the tax form. You're supposed to fill in the blanks with your information. Using the Lord's Prayer involves filling in the general categories with your personal information. Until we do that, the Lord's Prayer is too general and it's powerless. And our faith is powerless. Spiritual power in the world depends upon first overcoming Satan personally before we overcome his power anywhere else. But how many Christians pray anymore to overcome the specific temptations that they experience when they're under trial? We tend to pray about the trial, which is fine. Lord, deliver me from the trial. Jesus is saying, well, don't waste the trial. Before ever God takes that away, let's ask him to deliver us from the temptations that the trial engendered. That's the opportunity. That's the power. Don't waste that. Christian, it's, it's not unusual for us to ask God to pour out his power everywhere except in us. Oh, Lord God, please work in my son. Work in my daughter. Work in our church. Lord God, work in our country. And when we ask God to work, what we're asking for is an exercise of divine power to reverse the work of the devil. Well, that's a lot of what prayer is for, to call down God's will to be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer isn't just answered in a vacuum. It's answered in a way that overcomes the ruination caused by Satan, both directly and indirectly through all that he's baked into our culture. But Jesus teaches us to focus on overcoming Satan personally. That's a priority. Not by arm wrestling him or waving our arms, attempting some kind of magical binding. We need to overcome Satan by overcoming the temptations he puts in our face. Not generically, specifically. Our spiritual warfare can never expand to impact others and impact the world unless I first deal with it on a personal level. This is a prayer for people who want to make a difference for Jesus Christ in the world. Lord God, first... Deliver me from the power of Satan's temptations that are coming at me through my trials. This is spiritual warfare up close and personal, just the way Jesus did it. I had the privilege some years back of spending some time in the Judean wilderness where Jesus actually met Satan. Somewhere, somewhere in there is where it happened. It's an amazingly barren place. No trees no shelter of any kind. To this day, there are still packs of wild dogs. I heard them as the sun went down. The wind was cold. The whole place was just a chilling experience. In this wilderness, Jesus came face to face with the evil one. No one else there, nothing else there. Forty days, focusing on his mission. Satan comes to Christ as Christ is passionate about focusing on his mission. And Satan tempts him with ways to do that. Ways that involved personal compromise. It's great vision. You know, but do you really need to trust your father in everything? Can't you do some of this yourself? It's a great vision. 
Don't you think you ought to make sure God's behind you in this before you go any further? It's a great vision. Why do you need a cross? We can, we can do it without that. Jesus' power to accomplish God's will, which resulted in our salvation, depended first on dealing with those temptations. The Holy Spirit let him out to deal with them first. Jesus was tempted to ignore God as his Father, to put his own will above God's, to seek provision apart from seeking God's kingdom, to accept sin as an acceptable part of doing business. Temptations to forget all the things that Jesus told us to remember in the Lord's Prayer. None of these temptations were public. No news cameras, no witnesses. Personal temptation is never public. God was there. Satan was there. And Jesus was there. That's all. And there, in private, Jesus learned how to direct the Holy Spirit's power toward Satan's temptation against him and his trials. It was kind of like learning to use a laser to direct a hellfire missile launched from the sky. And Satan's attack was obliterated. It was obliterated. Christian, you could work in the Holy Spirit's power to build up, to do good, to heal and make a difference. How God could use you in that, it's, it's, it's hard to predict because the opportunities, the gifts he's given us to work with, the overlapping of our lives with other lives, the possibilities are infinite. God, God could use you within the great and public dramas of our time or maybe he could use you more profoundly to touch one or two people who are critical for the church's future. You could work in the power of the Holy Spirit to build up, to do good, to heal, to make a difference. But only after the Spirit's power obliterates the temptations that you personally face. Christian, if you can't stand up to Satan's temptations against you, your ministry will never get off the ground. And when I'm talking about your ministry, I'm not just talking about the Bible study in your home or uh, your Sunday school class. I'm talking about the impact of your influence and your prayers on your children. I'm talking about the impact of your prayers on your spouse. I'm talking about the impact of your prayers on the health of this church and the outreach of the entire church around the world. The impact of your prayers for our country. You have no spiritual power to work with, none to call down from heaven, until you first call it down to overcome the temptation staring you in the face that the evil one brings out from the trials you're facing. Power to make a difference starts in the wilderness of trials where there is only God and Satan and you. I think of it as Prayer directs the power of the Holy Spirit. Where are you being tempted? Where are you being tried? It's the same question. Where you're being tried is where you're being tempted, whether you realize it or not. You may just be focusing on the trial, but that's where your temptations are coming. You can study the Ten Commandments to brush up. You can study the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. You can study the Golden Rule to figure out where you're being tempted. Another way is to specifically ask, how am I being asked in this trial to ignore the Lord's Prayer? I don't mean ignore reciting it. I mean ignore God as my Father. Ignore God as my Lord. How am I being tempted to put, in terms of importance, my will above His will? How am I being tempted to grab for comfort rather than develop a partnership in working with whatever He's given me? How am I being tempted to accept personal sin as an acceptable way of life, something to ignore, something insignificant, Broken relationships, something I can tolerate because the mission's too important. Target God's power on those things as Jesus tells us to. We want to move out to other things, and God wants that too. He wants mountains moved. 
But the first and the most important mountain to be moved is the temptation that's staring at you. What are you going to do? Oh God, I ask you to do mighty things. And the first mighty thing I ask of you today, the first mighty thing is to give me victory over my distance from you, over my indifference to your will, over my obsession with things unrelated to your kingdom. Give me victory over my tolerance of broken relationships. First, give me the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And then I'm going to ask you for much more. I give assignments. Your assignment, should you choose to accept it this week. Ask God to obliterate one of Satan's temptations. You don't have to think hard about what it is. How are you being tried? And look there because you'll find your temptations there. In fact, try it out right now. Right now, as we come to the table. You know, of course, as we come to the table, we're going to be asking God to forgive us for past sins. But today, ask for more. Don't just look at yesterday's failure. Look at today's victory. Now, you may have to ask for a victory in the same thing tomorrow. That's okay. Let tomorrow worry about itself. You ask for victory today. Target Satan's temptation with a laser beam and ask God to send power from heaven to obliterate it so you can take that power with you as you leave. Let's pray. Father, I think all of us here have some understanding of the wilderness. But we don't necessarily know what it feels like to emerge from the wilderness with your power to do good and to overcome Satan's work in the lives of others. So, Father, as we come to your table... Help us to target one of Satan's temptations, something coming out of a trial right now, something that distracts us from you, something that's neutralizing us right now. Father, we're going to target it. And Father, we're going to call on you to annihilate it, at least for today. If need be, we'll target it again tomorrow. But right now, Lord God Almighty, take out Satan's attack. Do it directly. Do it immediately. Or put in our lives some new resource that'll deal with it. Just answer this prayer, Father, that your Son taught us to pray. Deliver us from the power of Satan's temptations. Lord, it's just you and Satan and us. But right now, as we come to your table, take him out of the picture. And let it be just you and us. We ask that in the name of the one who took him on and took him down. And soon we'll take him out. I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that our Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Because we're told as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. And he is. So in his name, I welcome you to his table.